We advise that tonight's episode of Crash contains scenes which may disturb some viewers. The car is one century old. In that time it has changed the world, changed the way we live, where we live, transformed the face of our towns and countryside. It has been a wonderful, liberating invention. But it has also brought untold grief. 25 million dead around the world and rising. It took half a century to realize this now we're attempting to curb the car's insatiable appetite for human life, to put the tiger back in its tank. The Mercedes S-Class is one of the biggest and strongest cars in the world. It's also one of the safest. But in Paris, on August the 31st last year, None of this was enough to prevent three of its occupants dying in the most notorious car crash of all time. Millions of words have been written about the events leading up to and following this accident. But apart from the identity of the victims, the stark reality was that faced by many of us each day. In a car crash, who lives and who dies and why? Professor Murray Mackay, Britain's leading car crash investigator, is in Paris. Using data from the French police investigation, he's made the first detailed reconstruction of what happened in the tunnel. According to the accident investigators, this is where the accident began. About 20 past midnight, the Mercedes is coming along this road on the left bank of the Seine towards the Armour Bridge. It heads down towards the underpass and it's estimated at that time it speeds about 70 miles an hour. What happens next is based on the evidence that we have so far. As he comes down into the tunnel, he's faced with a slow moving Fiat. He steers to the left. Because he's just come over a crest, the steering's light, he probably puts in too much steering, so he's heading towards the center columns. He corrects right, and now he's heading directly for the Fiat Uno. The Mercedes sideswiped the Fiat, snapping off its own driving mirror and smashing the Fiat's tail light. So far, just a minor collision. Was the Fiat just an innocent motorist returning late at night, or was there something more sinister than that? We may never know. The French police have given up the search for that vehicle. What we do know is that at this time in the accident sequence, the actions of the driver of the Mercedes were not those of somebody who was normal and alert. A 106-foot skid mark shows that the Mercedes driver pulled the steering wheel back to the left. Then the car mounted the pavement and smashed head-on into column 13. The car spun round and ended up facing in the direction it had come from. It's thought that the Fiat drove by without stopping. Speed, a driver under the influence of alcohol, the unexpected encounter with the Fiat, these all played their part. But you must remember that from the time the car entered the tunnel until it came to rest after the impact, that's only about two seconds. Newspapers have talked luridly of speeds of 120 miles an hour, but looking at the damage tells a very different story. It suggests an impact with the pillar of about 60 miles an hour. And we know that the car came to rest about 15 feet from the pillar, spinning out, and that means about 10 miles an hour exit speed from the pillar. So the change in velocity was slightly less than 50 miles an hour. And it's that change in velocity which is crucial in terms of the severity of the crash to which the occupants were exposed. This was a severe but a survivable accident, and what we now need to consider 
is why did three people die? Strangely, Princess Diana, sitting where I am in the right rear, had the best chance of survival because the impact was concentrated on the left front of the car and as it hit the pillar, it also rotated and span out so she went partly past the pillar and didn't have quite the same crash forces applied to her as happened to the people sitting on the left. If she'd been wearing a seatbelt, she'd have had a fair chance of surviving even this extreme accident. But, unbelted, she was thrown forward to strike the back of the front passenger seat, the door pillar, and then was tossed around after the main accident took place and the vehicle span out. There's one more thing that's obvious, that, you know, belted or unbelted, with almost total probability, if there'd been a guard rail fitted in this tunnel, then all of the occupants would probably have survived. The guardrail would have deflected the car along the line of the highway. There would have been no heavy hit, and the forces would have been survivable. The tunnel is one of the few in Paris with unguarded columns, despite the fact that it is one of the main thoroughfares of the city. Eight people have died here in 15 years. You know, the driver's been blamed, the paparazzi have been blamed, there's been suggestions even that Princess Diana was blamed for not wearing her seatbelt. But what is clearly obvious to me is the responsibility of the French authorities. You have a design here that's more appropriate for the horse and carriage age. If you'd spent 10 pounds per foot on a guardrail, three more people would be alive today. With this tragic accident, what we're showing is we're pushing the levels of survivability with car safety. It shows how far we've come, but it also shows in the wider aspects of safety how much further we have to go.